Um, and a microphone is coming to you. And I will repeat the question. Okay, this, is, this is for Dr. Hall. Uh, how would your maps change if you included refined products in those diagrams? Is no, that a substantial addition or is that sort of the same picture? So the question is how um, would the maps change that Dr. Hall showed if they include refined products? Uh, actually, that's a really interesting question. Is it, can you hear me? No. Can you hear me now? Now, still not. Turning it up. Better? Is it better? Oh, it's like this one. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, there we go. Well, well, your question's a really great one. See, uh, there's the refined products network as well. Crude oil moves in one set of pipelines, and refined products move in a completely different set of pipelines. The reason for that is that crude oil is dirty. You know, it's got stuff in it. Uh, it's, it grind, sand, all that stuff because it's come out of the ground or out of a crude oil tanker. Uh, it would contaminate gasoline or anything like that. So there is a very similar, in fact, I even have a picture of it, the refined products network for our region. It looks very similar, except there are many more smaller diameter pipelines. So that's, that's actually a separate issue. Uh, does that answer your question? We have a question online, or any other questions from the audience? And there's uh, someone in the back. Uh, we have one and two, Tom. Hi, um, my name is Shelly Catherine. I'm actually down here from Montreal. Um, no, I don't sound like I have a French accent. I'm originally from Syracuse, New York, but lived there for 22 years. My question, a question in a small, tiny little precision uh, uh, for Dr. Hull. Dr. Hull, I'm very interested to know, uh, you mentioned 200,000 barrels a day uh, going from Montreal uh, to Quebec City by water on the two Panamax. I'm wondering uh, where your figure comes from. So the question to Dr. Hall, can you repeat the question, Dr. Hall? Yeah, you, you want to know where the 200,000 figure came from? Yes. Uh, it, it's just an approximate. You see, line nine, I believe, has a capacity of over 300,000 barrels a day. Yes. And uh, I did an extrapolation as to what it appeared that uh, some four might take at Montreal, which would leave the rest to go to uh, you know, Valero or to well, other places. So it was purely an approximation. It's not an actual solid number. And for those, it's just a guess. And for those of you online, they're describing how he got his calculations from Montreal, um, right. Toronto and Montreal. And see, also, it's one of those things okay. that it, it will change month to month. You know, so. OK, thank you very much. And if I can make my little precision, I think you mentioned that there wasn't any opposition with that went through, there was a lot of opposition for line nine. Um, line which, nine yeah. of course, you're right, the, the, the uh, I think it was less well known right. the, that it stops in Montreal and goes on to a ship. And I think you're exactly right about that. Not a lot of opposition in terms of the, uh, the water life of that trip, although there was some, but certainly lots and lots of opposition to line nine, which is why I think energy used to it doesn't vote well for going through with respect to human. Thank you well, very much. Well, actually, fantastic. Line 9 is a very interesting story. When it was built in the early 70s, it was built to go to Montreal, yes. uh, related to the Arab oil crisis. And then some years later, it was reversed to come the other way. And now it's reversed going back. And there, there was a lot of environmental opposition to it. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. It was a great presentation. And we have a question over here, and then you're going to switch back to the back. And um, we'll ask if Tara can hang on. Hello, my question goes to Jerome. I have the same first name than you, so it's about the, the response. Um, in Canada, we have organizations that are responsible of uh, the response, not just the Coast Guard, uh, ECRC is uh, there for the Great Lakes region. 
And I was wondering, is, um, is there any print in the States, or is it all under the umbrella of the Coast Guard? And if there is that difference, do you see a, an advantage or a disadvantage with having in Canada organizations responsible for the response plus the government versus something else in the US? Okay, so that, that's a great question. It's, it's uh, asking is the regime for in Canada and the US the same for how uh, response corporations are managed under the, the law? So in, in both countries, uh, it's a principle of, of the responsible party is responsible for the, the, pay, the cost of um, the, the cleanup of a spill. How that equates to, uh, so in, in the U.S. typically um, a, res a re responsible party, if it's a facility or a vessel owner or whoever is a responsible party, is, is typically typically under their facility or vessel response plan going to identify a oil spill removal organization. Uh, so that can be anybody, like, you know, there's, there's hundreds of them in this region. Um, if it's if an RP is not able to be identified, a responsible party, or is not able to manage a response, and it's federalized on the U U.S., uh, then the Coast Guard or EPA would tap into oil spill liability trust fund to hire contractors. But it's not one. So in Canada, ECRC is called the only game in town, but it's a different type of system. So, so either way, the responsible party is going to be on the hook, but the way the contractors are managed is different between the two countries, if that makes sense. We have a question online. It's for Dr. Hull. Can you please elaborate on the large volume of oil that moves through Chicago? Please elaborate on the large volume of oil that moves through Chicago, Dr. Hull. Well, the, uh, in, this other panel, you know, in my slide, there was a phrase, Chicago is choke point USA. But Chicago is very well known as a very congested rail hub. Uh, I think that's the question pretty much is with regard to rail. It just says uh, elaborate on the point you were making about Chicago and the large volume of oil that moves through there. So that's what the... Okay, I, I assume that. Right? Yeah. I mean, a lot of pipeline oil moves through there as well. But uh, well, with, with regard to rail, uh, Chicago is well known as being highly congested and it's been that way for many years and probably will be. You know, any increase in rail one would have to look at the congestion and what sorts of problems that's going to create in the Chicago area. Uh, the other point I was trying to make with the rail was that uh, even uh, Alberta crude oil, uh, the access to the Alberta crude oil, that the big <coughs> that is going to come to the U.S. Gulf Coast, this is the Canadian National Railroad. The Canadian National Railroad from Alberta goes straight to Chicago and then slides down the state of Indiana, in Illinois, and then down along the Mississippi River to the Gulf Coast. So as bitumen moves in rail, it will more than likely be moving through Chicago as well. Uh, now as far as pipelines go, uh, it's sort of the same thing. The Alberta crude oil, as you would have noticed from that slide, does typically come down through the Chicago area, and there are expansion plans that have been looked at, like an expanding line three as a way of moving more crude oil. She said that did answer the question. So then I think we have a question in the back. Is that you? Do you have a question? It was. I can ask her. Jerry, I can disperse. Jerry, I'm familiar with um, some Coast Guard efforts, but I thought it'd be nice to share. Uh, there's a lot of concern about oil release in the hard winter time and ice recovery. Can you give any detail what you've been doing with Kirk Hansen and your research facility out there in New Jersey? Thanks, Matt. That's almost a planted question. If you look, which was okay. Thank you. So, so the question, so the question is uh, with regard to uh, response to oil in ice and winter conditions. Uh, so specifically, you know, one of the target areas has been the Straits of Mackinac. Uh, but just in general, uh, there's been a lot of you know, questions about the ability to respond to oil spills in ice. Um, so, uh, as uh, Matt was mentioning, the Coast Guard's Research and Development Center, which is based in New London, Connecticut, has a specialist that's been working this topic. Um, there's been three installments of what we call oil and ice uh, studies, um, uh, which were done in the Straits of Mackinac. Uh, and what those did was, was basically bring in um, you know, government and commercial uh, capabilities into the Straits and, and look at a variety of environments, weather conditions, um, some available technologies, uh, using some surrogates for oil and, and testing recovery, decontamination, uh, remote sensing, trying to define 
oil underneath ice or on the water. Uh, so the, all three of those reports are available online. Uh, if you remember in my presentation, I flashed the Federal On-Scene Coordinator's Guide to Oil and Ice. Uh, so that is the product that is the end result of those three studies. Um, and kind of the really short version, there's a lot in those, but um, so uh, sometimes I hear that people say, well, there's no way to recover oil and ice. Well, there are, and I think especially uh, ECRC, and among others, will be able to tell you, they, they've done a lot of that out in Canada. So there are certain tactics. Uh, so for example, on hard ice, you can slot the ice and have oil come up and then skim it that way. Uh, you can hurt it if it's through broken ice using you know, fire hoses and things like that. You can burn it. Can, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, so what, this, what these studies have done is basically show us some of the tactics that are available to be used. Now what that doesn't do is it's still in every individual situation, the federal hunting coordinator will have to approve and the and regional response have to approve with those tactics. So, so for example, nobody's gonna burn oil on the Great Lakes without without there being a lot of discussion from the, from the states, the natural resource trustees, and all things like that, for example. Um, but there are tactics that are available to uh, for the on coordinator to, to extract oil out of ice laden waters, as we say. Um, they're not easy and they're not foolproof, but and again, uh, strong winds and things like that make it difficult, but but the tactics are there um, and they're, they are available for the FOSC to use. So, thank you. So we have one question here. Question here, we have five questions here. Oh, one was okay. I have a response, not a question. <laughs> so that's the oil issue. Oh, you're right. We have to talk to them, like, people can take the next question. Take the next question. Okay. My question is for Lieutenant Joey. Um, I was wondering how much interaction do you have with the federal on-site coordinator for pre-planning? Discuss specific uh, water pathways and how you would respond to that. So I guess the question is, uh, how much direct interaction do I have with the on-scene coordinators prior to a spill? Uh, generally, it's uh, really limited uh, the amount of time I actually spend directly with the on-scene coordinators. The contingency planning uh, kind of handles that. They have uh, ge geographic uh, response strategies that they develop that. Um, our IRMA application and other things that would kind of guide uh, spill response. So generally the on-scene coordinator is kind of looking at it from above and the people on the ground kind of have uh, a little bit more information so they would uh, Sure, and now I'll pass this off to Jerry as well. I'm going to add on here because uh, there is one thing you should know. Uh, so Michael just arrived to us uh, you know, this summer, so he's brand new to the job. So I think, number one, he's done a fantastic job of assimilating all this information. It's a very complex thing. So, uh, uh, so number one, we're glad to have him because we're we'll looking forward to having him. Um, so, uh, the SOSC also gets to go to all our RRT, our, you know, our regional response team meetings, which are sort of the umbrella over all the area committees. So that's one of the things that we do is we engage really uh, with, with both Michael and uh, Steve Lehman from uh, the Boston area, who's also one of the, our, our representatives to RRT. So, um, so again, it's, it's not so much the specific you know, working with the FOSC, but, but there is a lot of engagement in um, especially tactics. So for example, um, one of the things that we're looking at, uh, the question has come up about in situ burning of oil on fresh water. So there's been, a lot of, there's been a lot of research and a lot of actual experience with doing in situ burning on salt water. Very little of it has been done in fresh water. So, so we've been working through, uh, we, we have a protocol in regional, uh, region five on how we're gonna do that it involves polling the, uh, the natural resource trustees, the scientific support coordinators in the state, water and air, uh, environmental people, discussing with the FOSC what, what's potentially going to be done, what the impacts are of that. So, so we have a protocol how we're going to handle it, but the bottom line is there's not a lot of R&D that's been done in freshwater burns. So that's just an example where the SSCs and NOAA in particular have, have been just very uh, critical to creating these protocols and how we're going to ask the questions, how are we going to proceed. So, uh, so I mean, we're really joining the pickers in our, you know, in our same building and we spent a lot of time working with the SSC and really can't, can't do without them. I'm going to take two more quick questions. There's one online and one in the audience. Is there additional <coughs> activity in the region around this material, perhaps incorporated into a product or 
using this material in the production process or something like that, digital refining perhaps. And please repeat the question. Yes. So, so the question was uh, whether or not we consider additional um, industries uh, other than agro transportation and refineries uh, in our analysis. Uh, the answer is uh, yes uh, and no. We, uh, yes, we also included uh, other modes of transportation in uh, the six uh, next codes, uh, six digits for the United States. There is actually one that is specific to Great Lakes freight uh, transportation. Not very big. Uh, uh, other include uh, long distance railroads and so forth. Uh, they are not specific, of course, they don't say necessarily whether or not oil or the share of oil uh, in, the, in, the, in the total revenues and the sales and so forth. Um, in terms of including refined products, we stopped and we didn't do that uh, because we focused on the crude oil. Um, certainly that's always sort of a balance and a decision in economic impact analysis, how far do I go? Um, the Great Lakes region has a strong uh, chemical manufacturing industry. Um, it's, uh, and I'm sure that the data for that is actually very poorly suited to build uh, um, pipelines, for instance. Uh, and so from a regional perspective, uh, that was about it. Uh, but we, no, we, we didn't include the, the products once, uh, once refined uh, and, and whatnot. Uh, okay, so there's one quick question and then from online and then we'll have the break. Okay. What can politicians, businesses, and voters do to encourage the use of the St. Lawrence Seaway to move crude oil and encourage Great Lakes area refineries to increase capacity? Are there limitations or dangers to this? Just a little question. Just a little question. And we need to remember, read that. It came from online. So does anyone want to take that? <laughs> Thank you. 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 Thank so the question was that, uh, what can be done to increase the transportation? Oh, is that connected though? Yes. Oh, I don't know. What can politicians, businesses, and voters do to encourage the use of the St. Lawrence Seaway to move crude oil and to encourage Great Lakes area refineries to increase capacity? Are there limitations and dangers? Such is the topic of this important degree. <laughs> I, I'll try to give a crack at that. I will answer with a question because I'm an academic, so you're not going to get a straight answer. Uh, but the counter question would be is it worth it? Why? And I'm not opposing movement of crude oil necessarily. Is, is it worth uh, your while in terms of the Great Lake region? It, because we found from the data we had that most of the jobs are not for manufacturing pipelines and so forth. Are not impacting the region. They're going to happen in Oklahoma, Texas, states that are better suited, longer history. Uh, pipelines don't create jobs when it comes to operating the pipeline. Uh, railways necessitate a lot of investments. So, you know, we don't have any amount of money. So, it depends. That's, do you want to? Okay, and on that note, right. go ahead. I'd like to take a shot at it too. Um, there, there are a number of things. Um, like first of all, from the map you folks saw of the refineries, there's so many of those refineries that are actually on the Great Lakes. Uh, the uh, Whiting Refinery in Chicago was on the Great Lakes. They got large docks. Uh, same with many of the refineries. A lot of them were built with, with the purpose of having water access. Uh, in the early days, when the Canadian oil was first discovered, the first pipeline was built as a period. And for 10 years, people thought shipped crude oil to Great Lakes refineries. So it's happened before in the past. Uh, there were issues with it. Uh, first of all, uh, the growing pipeline industry took the business away from water. Uh, so, they, so it ended. There's really, there is no crude oil moving on the Great Lakes at all. Uh, there's a little bit of refined products, but uh, no crude oil. Uh, one of the other issues with moving crude oil on Great Lakes is seasonality. The thing freezes. And, and even if it doesn't freeze, you still have to shut the locks for them for a, a few months every year. So it's not year-round business. So uh, while you could 
conceivably through oil on the Great Lakes, uh, it would be a real challenge to figure out how to do it you know, beyond the environmental issues. Right. Well, I'd like to thank our panel. For those of you in the audience who had additional questions, I'm sure these gentlemen will be around for the next couple of days, and I would encourage you to catch them out in the hallway. We're going to have a short break. Please try to 